and just a throwback to April in Chicago when I had the absolute privilege to see Dr. Murganathan and Dr. Maheshwari at the wonderful India chapter reception. And with that, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Can you all hear me? Okay, I'm gonna start. Um, well, greetings from the ACP again. And as chair of the ACP Board of Regents, it is my honor to have been asked to participate in the India ACP chapter meeting. I am indebted to your governor, Dr. Mahashwari, for the kind invitation. All of us at ACP appreciate the engagement of the India chapter and its excellent leadership. We especially appreciate how many of your members make the long journey to ACP's internal medicine meeting every year. And special thanks to Dr. Murganathan for his commitment to this chapter and to ACP. And we look forward to seeing many of you in San Diego in April. And when I spoke with Dr. Mahashwari about the topic for this session, he suggested that I speak about the importance of immunization for women's health. I really love that idea, especially when he told me that the theme of this year's conference is back to basics. And he stressed that women's health is pivotal for the whole family's health. And I would add, women's health is pivotal to the entire community. And I wanna share a quote with you that I think will help frame our discussion. The impact of vaccination on the health of the world's peoples is hard to exaggerate. And with the exception of safe water, no other modality has had such a major effect on mortality reduction and population growth. And we at ACP are so proud of the India ACP chapter for its efforts to increase immunization through Project IRIS. So in my remarks, I'll briefly address the history of immunizations in India and then build the case for the importance of vaccination for all Indians with special emphasis on girls and women. So many of you probably know the history I'm, I'm about to share, but it really helped me understand better the scope of the work in India. So the process of inoculation or variolation with smallpox virus was widely practiced in India, even in the 1700s. The first dose of smallpox vaccine in India arrived in May of 1802. And until the 1850s, the vaccine was imported from Great Britain, which certainly posed significant logistical challenges. Smallpox vaccine was successfully created in Chennai in 1880. In 1892, the Compulsory Vaccine Act was passed. Cholera and plague vaccines began to be made in India, and in the late 1940s, the first of many BCG laboratories was created in Chennai as well. And in 1977, India was declared smallpox-free. So I highlight this story to show that India has a long history of vaccine and vaccine manufacture. So more recently, the World Health Organization launched the Expanded Program on Immunization, which was launched in 1974, which India joined in 1978. It was renamed the Universal Immunization Program when it was expanded beyond urban areas and in 1992 became part of the National Reproductive and Child Health Program. UIP is one of India's largest public health programs, targeting close to 26 million newborns and 29 million pregnant women annually. Those are amazing numbers. It's highly cost effective, and it's largely responsible for the reduction in mortality rate in children under five years of age. And finally, two major milestones of UIP in India have been the elimination of polio in 2014 and maternal and neonatal tetanus in 2015. India has also launched the intensified mission Indra Hanush 4.0 in phases in 2022 to achieve its goal of providing full immunization coverage of 90%, which is an amazing goal, and beyond to boost the, pro the reach of the universal immunization program. So now I'm gonna to turn to examine some of the benefits of vaccination. Uh, there are very obvious benefits to vaccination, but some may not be as obvious. So I'll start with the obvious ones first. The most significant impact of vaccines has been to prevent morbidity and mortality from serious infections that disproportionately affect children. Vaccines are estimated to prevent almost 6 million deaths per year and to save 386 million life years globally. 
So now we'll look at specific populations of women and immunization recommendations. This is not an exhaustive uh, overview, but I, hopefully I'm highlighting some uh, major important ones. So we all know that immunizations are an essential part of prenatal care. And in our country, in my country, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention recommend that women who are pregnant receive an inactivated influenza and tetanus diphtheria acellular pertussis vaccine in every pregnancy. In the U.S., among women of reproductive age, pregnant women account for more than a quarter of flu-associated hospitalizations each season. So influenza can be a devastating disease for pregnant women because of the increased risk of fetal demise, preterm labor, and preterm birth. So influenza vaccination plays an important role in protecting pregnant women from serious illness. In addition, flu vaccination during pregnancy transfers antibodies to the fetus, helping to protect babies against flu before they're eligible for the vaccination at six months of age. And uh, pertussis, as you know, can be a deadly infection for infants and children. In most cases, occur in infants less than two months old. Babies in this group account for 69% of pertussis deaths each year. But infants are not eligible for the first dose, uh, contain, the pertussis-containing vaccine, until they're two months of age. So as a result, newborns are best protected if their mothers receive a Tdap vaccine during pregnancy. Pregnant women should receive the pertussis vaccine during each pregnancy, as I've already said, and ideally between 27 and 36 weeks of gestation. And when a woman receives the vaccine, again, maternal antibodies are passed to the fetus, giving them a boost of protection at birth. And it's important to note that spouses, family members, and other folks in the, in the household should also receive the Tdap vaccine if they haven't been vaccinated before. Pregnant and recently postpartum women are more likely to have severe COVID infection. Um, in a recent study from the National Institutes of Health in our country that looked at nearly 2,400 pregnant women who were infected with SARS-CoV-2, and they found that, uh, that, all, all, that all those with moderate to severe infection were more likely to have a cesarean delivery, to deliver preterm, to die around the time of birth, or to experience illness from hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, postpartum hemorrhage, or from infection other than SARS-CoV-2. They were also more likely to lose the pregnancy or to have an infant die during the newborn period. A mild or asymptomatic infection was not associated with increased pregnancy loss. Therefore, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology and the ACP recommend that all pregnant women receive COVID-19 vaccination. It has been demonstrated over and over again that the vaccines are safe in pregnancy and can be administered at the same time as influenza and pertussis. Now, infection with rubella and measles virus um, can cause severe damage um, especially in the first 12 weeks of gestation. Um, so infection early in pregnancy is really associated with bad outcomes. However, rubella and measles vaccine is contraindicated in pregnancy because it's a live virus. So women planning pregnancy should be immunized prior to becoming pregnant, um, if at all possible. India has adopted the National Strategic Plan for Achieving and Sustaining measles and rubella elimination in India. It's vaccinated over 324 million children. It's amazing. Between 2017 and 2020 through the MR vaccination campaign. And despite the challenges caused by the COVID pandemic, India has made remarkable progress in the elimination of measles and rubella. In addition, uh, fever and rash surveillance were extended to all parts of the country uh, while MR Laboratories um, Network further expanded to include 27 laboratories. Uh, other actions, including the strengthening of routine immunization during the pandemic, which is no small feat, uh, again, including the vaccination of around 1 million children during IMI 3.0. 
So polio. Polio was eradicated in India in 2014. And the last case of wild-type polio was reported in January 2011. The routine immunizations and things like the National Immunization Days work to ensure that all children under five are vaccinated against polio. India simultaneously conducts acute flaccid paralysis surveillance to look for any signs of polio, as well as environmental surveillance. And in Kolkata, in April of this year, you probably are aware that one vaccine-related polio sample was recovered from sewage. And this set in motion an extensive evaluation, and fortunately, no other samples were found. Now, I want to contrast this with the situation in the United States. So the last case of polio in the U.S. was reported in 1979. However, in June of this year, 2022, a case of paralytic polio occurred in an unvaccinated man in New York State. <clears throat> and genetic analysis showed that it was, in fact, vaccine-derived, so it was not wild-type. And only then was wastewater surveillance launched, and 82 genetically-related samples were identified. This episode confirms that the vigilance shown in India in your fight against polio and other deadly infectious diseases can serve and does serve as a model for other countries. And Dr. Choi talked uh, about human papilloma virus, um, especially in HIV positive people, but I have to tell you that I was so happy to read very recently that an Indian maid HPV vaccine called Cervavac has recently been released. Uh, this can be a game changer. Cervical cancer is the second most common cancer among Indian women. It's 1.2 million women in India diagnosed every year with 67,000 deaths from this disease. And since we know that human papillomavirus causes up to 90% of cervical and anal cancer, the availability of a low-cost vaccine, and this is estimated between 200 and 400 rupees, has a great potential to reduce the burden of cervical cancer and other cancers associated with HPV. Cervavac will be administered in two doses among girls aged 9 to 14 and three doses for women and girls ages 15 to 26. Now, I might mention that in the United States, it is also recommended for boys. And so now I'm going to turn a little bit and talk about other benefits of vaccination. So in addition to preventing serious illness, disability, and death from infectious diseases, there are a number of other benefits to vaccination. Herd immunity. Um, in herd immunity, there's indirect protection from an infectious disease that happens when a population is immune through vaccination or previous infection. Now, herd immunity for measles requires 93 to 95% of a population to be vaccinated with two doses <clears throat> to interrupt transmission of the measles virus. And for high-risk individuals, those who are immunocompromised, uh, who have underlying serious medical conditions, who are unable to be vaccinated, herd immunity really can be a life-saving measure. Now, you look, contrast, herd immunity for polio requires about 80% of the population to have immunity. We've also seen herd immunity against some GI viruses or GI illnesses, including cholera and rotavirus. We do not yet know the level of herd immunity required to protect a community against COVID-19. Dr. Choi talked uh, a little bit about cancers associated with infectious diseases, and I, I touched on <clears throat> the benefit of HPV vaccine but I want to also talk about hepatitis B vaccine. It can prevent chronic hep B infection, which can lead, as we know, to cirrhosis, hepatocellular car carcinoma. And, and importantly, 70 to 90% of babies born to mothers who are hep B surface antigen and hep B core positive will become infected without prophylaxis. Hep B, hep B vaccine and immunoglobulins can be used to minimize uh, vertical transmission. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about reduction in secondary infections that can complicate vaccine preventable diseases. Vaccines can prevent diseases beyond a specific infection that they're designed to target. Infections with pathogens, in particular viruses, can predispose to the acquisition of other bacterial infections. For example, 
influenza virus vaccine, both seasonal and pandemic, is frequently complicated by bacterial pneumonia and acute otitis media, infrequently aspergillus pneumonia pneumonitis. It is believed that during the influenza pandemic of 1918 and 19, secondary bacterial bronchopneumonia was strep pneumo, strep pyogenes, H flu, and staph, staph aureus identified at autopsy really was likely the culprit for the excess mortality that was observed among healthy children and adults. And as we mentioned before, influenza vaccines can be beneficial in preventing these complications. And also, morbidity, including acute otitis media in children. There is increasing evidence supporting the use of influenza vaccine for the secondary prevention of myocardial infarction. Also, people who develop shingles are about 30% higher risk for stroke. So the use of herpes zoster vaccine has another benefit. And finally, it's been suggested that vaccination with pneumococcal vaccines is associated with a 50% decrease in the risk of myocardial infarction two years after vaccination. Another associated benefit of vaccination is preventing antibiotic resistance. As we are all aware, the rise in antimicrobial resistance is a universal threat. Um, and the development of antimicrobial resistance in bacteria is a cumulative process, frequent repeated exposures to broad spectrum antibiotics as a major cause. Children and the elderly who are at particular risk of an infection can and do benefit from vaccines against common primary and secondary infections such as pneumonia, otitis media, and cellulitis, secondary to varicella zoster, uh, and typhoid fever um, vaccines alleviates the need for antibiotics being prescribed or bought. I'm going to turn now um, to talk about the economic, some of the economic benefits of vaccination. And vaccines are highly beneficial on a population level as well as an individual level. Also, they're very cost effective in comparison with other public health interventions. The reduction in morbidity and mortality associated with successful vaccine, vaccine programs through a combination of direct and indirect protection has led to reduced incidence of diseases and associated treatments and healthcare costs. This potentially leads to economic growth with less money spent owing to the costs averted through fewer medical tests, procedures, treatments, and time off work by patients and parents as well. It's estimated that the net economic impact of eradication of disease has been estimated both for smallpox and polio. For smallpox, the eradication costs were over $100 million, $1 million U.S., but there are cost savings of $1.35 billion U.S. dollars annually. And the elimination of polio was estimated to save $1.5 billion U.S. dollars annually. Um, extensive vac vaccinations of populations can and do reduce pressure on healthcare facilities, especially at the hospital level. And I can tell you that right now, as we're speaking in the United States, we're seeing our hospitals overwhelmed with children with respiratory syncytial, syncytial virus, influenza, and still seeing some COVID. And unfortunately, <clears throat> there are currently no vaccines available in the U.S. for RSV, but I understand that one is uh, close to being uh, released. So a healthy population contributes to and enhances the economy. Economic impact of vaccines really should be considered more broadly than just the avoided healthcare cost from prevented illness episodes. Healthy children demonstrate increased educational attainment through better attention and cognitive performance. And as a result of vaccinations, healthy and economically successful families have lower fertility and smaller families. Again, the economic impact of adult illness is evident from the loss of productivity and pay, at least for the duration of the illness and the recovery period. And unfortunately, the impact of childhood illness falls primarily on their adult caregivers, generally parents, since 
when a child is unwell with childhood illnesses, which may or may not require admission to the hospital, parent will invariably have to forego their paid employment to click care for the child. The loss of productivity in the parental workforce tends to disproportionately affect women, but loss of either parental attendance at work has an effect of reducing overall income, productivity, and in the short term is rarely able to be replaced. Now I'm going to talk a, a bit about the social benefits of immunization. So we talk a lot about health equity, and health equity we believe is achieved when every person has the opportunity to attain his or her full health potential, and no one is disadvantaged from achieving this potential because of social position or other socially determined circumstances. Health inequities are reflected in differences in length of life, quality of life, rates of disease, disability and death, severity of disease, and access to treatment. And the impact of vaccines on the inequity of those living in poverty is significant. And modeling of the impact of the rotavirus vaccine in India across all social classes suggests that the vaccine program provides the poor with both health and financial benefits. It's really important to include such equity impacts in the health economic modeling of vaccines. Uh, and it will help, uh, help better policy decisions uh, to be made, which will target the most vulnerable in society. Finally, I do wanna talk about the empowerment of women under a vaccine uh, program. So the empowerment of women is a driver and it's also an effective vaccination programs. And in a study in Bihar State in rural India involving an empowerment program where participating women were educated about health and hygiene, there was a higher rate of pertussis, measles, and BCG vaccines in their children compared to non-participants in the villages running the program. A separate public health initiative in Haryana, India, conducted between 20, 2005 and 2012 to reduce maternal and child health inequalities involving um, increasing access and provision of health resources to rural areas. The poor in society, women and children, one significant outcome of this initiative was the equitable provision of immunizations to girls and boys. And I know that this is part of a project at IRIS really to, to focus on girls and women. And so by improving infant and childhood mortality from infection, more children will survive to adulthood with the potential to have productive and healthy lives. And this will and has led to healthy and economically secure women having fewer children and less peripartum morbidity and mortality. Thus, women are able to spend more time with children and on their development, as well as their own education and contribution to the workforce. So the strategy of maternal vaccination has demonstrated great success at preventing diseases that afflict infants too young to be vaccinated against pertussis, influenza, and tetanus. Not surprisingly though, factors influence the up, influencing uptake of maternal vaccination include what was the woman's previous experience with healthcare and vaccines. It's crucial to provide the access and support required to enable them to make informed choices during their pregnancies. So I hope that my comments serve to reinforce the far reaching effects that vaccinations can have, especially on the health and welfare of the women and children in society. India has shown that it has the will and the dedication to eradicate communicable diseases and thus improve the status of all its citizens. I believe that you will continue to find successes despite the many challenges of delivering vaccinations in this vast country. So once again, congratulations on Project IRIS and all the work that you do. And thank you very much for this opportunity.